Hello readers, we are in the Sign of the Beaver, chapter 23, or we are nearing the very end. So in chapter 22, we said goodbye, Matt and Aten said goodbye to each other. Um, Aten was leaving to go on his big hunt, and then he told Matt that um, their family would not return to this village again, and they're going to find um, a new village to set up. Um, so now the big question is, what is going to happen to Matt? Will Matt's family come back? You know, let's read to find out. Chapter 23. Matt filled his days with work. He made the cabin trim. Where the clay had dried up and crumbled away before between the logs, he brought new mud, strengthened it with pebbles, and packed the spaces tightly. On the inside, he chinked every tiny crack to make the room snug. The pile of logs stacked against the cabin wall grew steadier and higher. His meager harvest was safely stored away. The corn, the little he had managed to save from the deer and the crows, had all been shucked. Sitting by the fire after his supper, he scraped the dried kernels from the cob, remembering the many long evenings at home when he and his sister Sarah had been set to the same work with the corn scraper. Sarah would laugh now to see him rubbing away with an old clamshell like an Indian. Some of the ears of corn had hung against the wall by the twisting hu husks as he had seen his mother do. She had said once that they were like scraps of sunshine in the dark days. Overhead, he hung stripe, strips of pumpkin on ropes of vine strung from wall to wall. This would be ready for his mother to make into pies. In a corner leaned the old flour sack, overflowing with nuts he had gathered, hickory and butternut, and even some acorns. He had once thought proper food only for squirrels. On the shelf ranged birch baskets filled with dried berries and wild cranberries he had discovered shining like jewels along the boggy shores of the pond. There were puckery, that's injury, there were puckery to the tongue, but when his mother came she would bring sugar and the stewed cranberries would make for a fine treat of her bread and white flour. Matt forced himself to eat sparingly of these things. The corn he regarded as sort of a trust his father had planted it and would be counting on it to feed the family through the winter, and some must be saved for the spring planting. Proud, though, he was of his harvest. Matt knew in his heart that it was far from enough. The hunt for food would be never-ending. Hour after hour with his bow, Matt trapped through the forest, the dog beside him. There was not much game to hunting these days. More often than not, his snares were empty. Soon the animals would be buried deep in burrows, Twice he had glimpsed a caribou moving through the trees, but he had little hope of bringing down any large animal with his light arrows. Once in a long, long while, he succeeded in shooting a duck or a muskrat. The squirrels were too quick for him, although the dog was certainly not much of a hunter. He did occasionally track down some small creature, but he also had to eat his share, sometimes more than his share, because Matt could not resist those beseeching eyes. Truth to tell, they were both hungry much of the time. Luckily, they would not starve with the pond and creeks teeming with fish. Matt knew that for many months of the year, fish filled the Indian cook pots. Luckily, too, fish were easy to catch, though Matt had, been, had to be continuous, continually twisting and splicing new lines from vines and spruce roots. Morning now, he had to shatter the skim of ice on the pond, Soon, he would have to cut holes with his axe to let the lines down deep. He shivered to think of it. It was the cold that had bothered him most. His home spun jacket was still sound, since he had little use for it in the warm weather, but his breeches were threadbare. He knew, oh, I'm sorry, one knee showed naked through the gaping hole, and the frayed legs stopped for good five inches above the ankle. His linen shirt was thin and page of his father's Bible, and so small for him that it threatened to split at every time he moved. Even inside the cabin, he was scarcely warm enough. The moment he ventured outside, his teeth chattered. He thought enviously of the Indian's deerskin leggings, but a deer was far beyond his powers as a hunter. There were two blankets on his pine bed, his father's and his own. Why couldn't one of them cover him in the daytime as well as in the night? He spread the blanket out on the floor and hacked at it with his axe and his knife. 
using the worn out britches as a pattern. From the left scraps, he carefully pulled threads and twisted them together. He had seen the Indian woman using bone needle and he searched about the outside of the cabin till he found some thin, hard bits of bone. These he shaved down with his knife. He ruined three bits trying to poke a hole through the bone before he thought to try a thin slit instead of a hole the, um, for the thread. Finally, he managed to sew the wooden pieces together, the woolen pieces together. He thrust his legs into shapeless britches and gathered the top about his waist with a bit of rope. He was mighty pleased with himself. He was going to be forever hauling them up and they were sure to trip him if he had to run, but at least he could kneel in the ice and pull the lines in. From two rabbit skins, he made some mittens without thumbs. He had no stockings, and his moose-hide moccasins were wearing thin. He decided he could stuff them with scraps of blanket or even with duck feathers. He remembered that once in a downpour, a ten had showed him how to line his moccasins with dried moss to soak up the rain. Perhaps moss could soak up the cold as well, there was plenty about, of that about. His most satisfying achievement was his fur hat. For this, he knew he must have more fur. In the woods, a ten had once pointed out to him a deadfall constructed of heavy logs so intricately balanced that they would fall with deadly accuracy on any animal that attempted to steal the bait inside. Beaver and otter were caught in such traps, a ten explained, sometimes even a bear. Now Matt determined to make one for himself, perhaps a small one, it would take a very large log, even a strewn of strong animals, and he had no wish to come upon a wandering bear, a wounded bear. Much as he would like a bear skin, he would try for a smaller animal. He felled and trimmed two good side trees. Setting the logs on lighter posts was a feat of delicate balance that took him hours of patient trial and error. Over and over they crashed down, threatening his toes and fingers. Finally, they held to his satisfaction, and gingerly he slipped three fish inside the trap. To his astonishment, on the third morning, he found an animal lying under the fallen logs, so nearly dead that it was no task to club it. It was smaller than the otter um, he had seen playing along the banks, a fisher perhaps. That night, he and the dog fastened, feasted on crackling bits of roast meat. It was strong flavored, and he knew the Indians did not care to eat it, but he could not be so choosy. Other strips he hung over the fire to smoke. There was also a scant amount of yellow fat. Used sparingly, a spoonful of the fat would make his usual fish diet taste a little, um, taste like a banquet. The real treasure was the pelt, heavy and lustrous. He worked on it slowly as he had watched the Indian woman work. With a sharp-edged stone, he scraped away every trace of fat and the flesh from the skin, washed it in the creek, and for days, in his spare hours, rubbed, the stretch, rubbed and stretched it to make a soft and pliable. Then he set to work with his bone needle. He was enormously proud of the cap he, fast, he fashioned. Sassiskin himself would have envied it. Most of this work he had done by firelight. He longed for candles. He ate his supper by the light of the split pine branches set in the crack of the chimney. They gave light a plenty, but they smoked and dripped sticky pitch. And he was always afraid he might drop off to sleep and wake up to find his log chimney afire. At any rate, after a day of chopping and tramping, trapping, he was tired enough to go to bed with the dark. So often as he did the squaw work that a ten would have despised, Thoughts of his mother filled his head. He imagined her moving about the cabin, humming, humming her little tunes as she beat up the batch as she beat up a batch of cornbread, shaking out the broadcloth at the door. For the course, she would not let them eat at a bare table. She could see her sitting by the firelight in the evening, her knitting needles clicking as she made woolen socks for him. Sometimes she he could almost hear the sounds of her voice and when he shut his eyes, he could see her special smile. He tried to think of ways to please her. She would need new dishes for the good meals she would cook. He whittled out four wooden trenchers, trenchers and four clean new bowls, rubbed them smooth with sand from the creek. Um, he made a little brush to clean them with from birch saplings.
carefully splitting the ends into thin fibers. In the same way, he made a sturdy birch broom to sweep the floor. Then he set himself a more difficult task, a cradle for the baby. With only an ax and his knife, he work, the work took all his patience. His first attempts were fit only for kindling, but when the cradle was done, he was proud of it. He was clumsy, perhaps, but it rocked without bumping, and there wasn't a splinter anywhere to harm the baby's skin. Sitting by the fire, it seemed a promise that soon his family would be there. When he had a few more rabbit skins, he would make soft coverlets. For Sarah, he made a corn husk doll with corn silk hair. He was surprised at how much he looked forward to Sarah coming. Back at home, she had been nothing but a pesky child, always following him about and pestering him to be taken along wherever he was going. Now he remembered the way she had run to meet him when he came home from school, pigtails flying, eyes sh shining, demanding to know everything that had happened there. Sarah hated fiercely being a girl and having no school to go to. She would be full of curiosity in the forest. She wasn't afraid of like most girls. She was spunky enough to try almost anything. She was like the Indian girl, a ten sister. What a pity they could never have known each other. Again, another very powerful chapter in the sense of Matt. Matt has completely grown up, right? Think of our five W's, who, what, why, where, when, and how. All right, Matt is growing up. He may not be a hunter out going up north to hunt moose and caribou, but he's not just thinking about himself. You know, he's trying to think ahead. He needed to make himself warm clothes. He needed to harvest food for himself and his family when, he when they come, if they come back. So it's interesting to see how he may be only 13 in this book. But he seems to be wise, much beyond his years. We have two chapters left. I wonder if his family is going to come back. We'll have to find out.